Tonight, uh, uh, normally we have uh, testimony time. If you had uh, come with one uh, with a uh, testimony that you wanted to share with the rest of the folks, uh, you'll have to wait. Except I'm going to give one person an opportunity because I know what that testimony is, and that's Brother Herrick. I want him to be able to share that with you all. So really quick, Thomas, I'm going to have you just run that microphone back to Brother Herrick because I want you to hear this. I was excited. I was shouting, and I praise the Lord uh, for that. So... Uh, uh, normally we don't do this, and I don't want to take away from the missionaries. But I want to let you hear this. So, so my uh, the white one there. Okay, he's got it. Okay. Yep, it's on. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> it didn't sound like it. Um, my brother called me. He's not doing well, as you all know, and uh, he called me. I think it was Thursday. Said he was in the hospital. I'm like, okay, how you doing? And I'm like, no, not, not doing great. But um, I had to go down to Janesville, because that's where he's at, for work. And I went down yesterday morning, and I got done what I needed to get done. And I asked my sister, well, where's the hospital at? And the hospital is like not even a mile away from each other, almost on the same highway. So it was easy for me to, to go visit him. And I went up and I and I saw him and I was talking to him and and he, he was he was scared he was really scared he was going to die that day because they told him if he went and went in that that day he did he he wouldn't be here with us right now so I just started talking to him and next thing you know I led him to the Lord Amen Amen Praise the Lord and. Uh... That was, that was awesome. He got to share that with me as he was uh, uh, shaking hands going through this morning. And uh, I wanted you all to hear that because uh, that, that, that was the first one you ever got to lead the Lord. Is that right? Amen. And uh, so that is awesome that uh, his brother is his first uh, uh, one that he got to lead the Lord. And, and it's awesome, isn't it? Now there's more. Amen. There's more fish out there. Amen. And we just got to be... Amen. 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 It's amazing the peace that God gives a person. Amen. We're to be fishers of men, and uh, praise the Lord for that. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, I don't want to take any other time uh, from our missionary. And uh, uh, so if you did bring a, a, a testimony that you wanted to share, uh, hold on to it next week. Uh, we'll share it next week, and uh, you'll be able to share it then. Uh, but uh, I've known I've known the searches forever. I don't I don't ever remember meeting you folks. I just always have known you and uh, uh, been good friends down through the years. And and uh, we were talking about it not too long ago. I was like, you know, it's been a while since we've had you come. He goes, yeah. And then he looked. He goes, I think it's been about ten years. Is that about right? Ten years or close to it? Seven? Last time you heard? Yeah. That you preached? Six years. Maybe six, seven, six or seven years ago? Okay. I know, I know it's been a while, uh, but uh, uh, anyways, uh, we're, we're glad that uh, uh, he's able to be here tonight. I'll let him introduce the video, and then I'll introduce him for uh, the preaching uh, as well. But uh, uh, he'll also introduce his wife, Tricia. So. All right. Well, it is good to be here tonight. And uh, I was looking back on our records, and I said to Mrs. Hallett, I said it was 40 years ago, February of this year, last February, was 40 years when we first came here. Amen. So uh, that's a long time, you know. And uh, uh, I'm going to introduce my wife, Tricia, first, right there. She, she doesn't like to stand up or be noticed, but anyway, uh, the Bible says a prudent wife is from the Lord. And the Bible says he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Well, that scripture's true. I found a good thing. And so we've been married now in August. It'll be 51 years. Amen. And so uh, she's been a great uh, a wife and mother to our children and a great help. Randy King, who you know, many of you know, he said one time, he said, I think Ken Sturtz's greatest asset is his wife, Tricia. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so Randy King would say something like that, you know. But anyway, I, I've known Randy since we were in grade school. He's two years behind me. He was in sixth grade. I was in the eighth grade. Would pull all kind of antics and tricks, and that was before he was saved. So I won't get into all of that, but you know, I'm really glad he got saved because that that helped the whole world. Believe me. So anyway, so anyway, uh, so good to be here. Our ministry is Couriers for Christ, and we're a, a ministry of Wildwood Baptist Church in, in Oshkosh, and uh, we've been uh, at this now uh, uh, since 1984. Your your church is this church was either the first or the second church that we came to to present the Courier's ministry. Amen. So for us to be that new and that green and for you to take us on for support and pray for us and support us, uh, you know, you were taking a risk, but, but you know, you did it. And, and we're grateful, we're thankful for that over all these years. So thank you for your prayers, your support. I know it's not been 40 years that you supported us, but pretty close. Yeah. And that's a long, long time. And we're, we're grateful and thankful for that. But our ministry has three parts. The uh, first part of it was smuggling operations in Eastern Europe, taking things into the communist countries. That was uh, a dangerous business, and it was, it was very difficult. And there's books been written on that subject that you can read. I know many of you have. And then uh, after 1990, 1989-90, things opened up in Eastern Europe. Those countries uh, capitulated. The, the communist government opened up, let people come in, and uh, we had a great opportunity for 10 years to take in just tons of scripture. Um, we shipped in a lot of material for missionaries. There were that first, uh, during those years, that first year, like 1990, we helped a dozen missionaries get into Eastern Europe because we had contacts and helped them get established. And uh, we shipped in all kinds of things that, that were mi help to missionaries, but we're majoring always on the scripture. And starting in around 2000, 2001, we started doing scripture campaigns where uh, missionaries were needing help. I mean, you take you know, yourself and your wife and you go into a city of six million people and it's like a daunting, like, how am I possibly going to reach these people? Well, it takes help. And so we, uh, there had been missionaries before in Mexico that used a campaign type of outreach where they would take a group of people that would volunteer to go for a state to stay for a period of time. Uh, we were doing it for two weeks, and uh, we've been doing that ever since. We've had now, what is it, 25, over 25 campaigns in major cities uh, in Eastern Europe in 17 different languages. And uh, we take up to 36 people at a time, stay for two weeks, pass out John and Romans. 
We just got back from Split Croatia a couple of weeks ago, and uh, these are the John and Romans we handed out in the Croatian language, and we handed out 55,000 of them in Split Croatia. And uh, you say, Split Croatia, where's that? Well, if you know where Italy is, most people know where Italy is, it's shaped like a boot. If you go, it's about a thousand miles long, but if you go down halfway down Italy, and then go to the east across the Adriatic Sea, which is about 80 miles, you will come to the city of Split. And it was a very uh, important city uh, established about 2,600 years ago and by the Romans. And the Romans had, uh, actually the Roman uh, emperor Diocletian had his palace there. And the uh, ruins are still there. I mean, it's not, it's magnificent yet. There's uh, 12 acres of palace and palace grounds that are there. And uh, Diocletian was one of the last of the Roman empires. In fact, he was the last of the old Roman empire. empire, empire. And uh, he was told by his generals and by his advisors that Christianity was ruining the Roman empire. And so uh, in, in about 284, he started to reign and he reigned until like 305. And during that period of time, he established some of the worst persecution against Christians that there ever was. I mean, he killed uh, personally, they said he orchestrated the killing of 3,500 Christians. Thousands of them were murdered under his reign. We were in Split. There's an uh, amphitheater there that holds about 35,000 people. Uh, the ruins are there. Yeah, you know, the, 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 well, it's all there. You can see the, uh, it's like the Colosseum in Rome, only smaller. But uh, on that ground, thousands of Christians were murdered. It's, it was just eerie to walk across that area knowing that the blood of your brothers and sisters and my brothers and sisters in Christ uh, was soaking that ground. And, uh, of course, after that, after he, he died, uh, Diocletian, then uh, Constantine came into trouble. And I say, the, uh, if you can't lick them, join them. That's what happened. Constantine then... Uh, became a Christian. He saw supposedly a cross in the sky, and he became a Christian by, you know, not being born again, but, you know, in his mind. And then he wanted the whole empire to be Christian. Well, that was the start of the Roman Catholic Church. And, of course, the Roman Church ever since that time has been a power to, you know, through us you go to heaven. Well, no, it's through Christ that you go to heaven. But anyway, that's, that's the place that we were, and we had a meeting, 55 people came to the meeting. What we do is we invite people to come. Uh, we had invitations. These, uh, I'll show you one of the invitations we pass out along with the John and Romans on the streets. We had 30 people there with us helping out. And uh, pass these out, invite them to, we had a hotel that had a large, actually about 500 seat capacity room, it was huge. And we invited them there and then the gospel was preached to them. Two women got saved during that meeting. Three others said they wanted to come to a Bible study, and the missionary, John Leslie, was very happy. He says, I'm, I'm glad for what happened. And it puts him on the map. I mean, people know that he's not a cult, him and his wife by himself. He has a lot of people that believe like he does, and he wants to spread this word of God throughout the city of Split. So pray for him, uh, 200,000 people in Split. It's a... Now a tourist town, really, on the, on the, uh, the Adriatic Sea. Uh, it's a beautiful place, really. And uh, if you ever want to go to Europe and take a vacation where it's not so expensive, that's a place you could go. It's very beautiful. But they need the gospel, and uh, that's why we're there. But anyway, we'll show you a, a little eight-minute DVD here. I'll give you kind of a, an overview and pictures and that, uh, probably better than I could say it with words. So we'll, we'll show you that. Is it okay if this is recorded? This will be good. That's fine. Baptist Careers for Christ is a ministry that was founded by Donald Sturtz in 1979, following a survey trip behind the Iron Curtain the previous year. While there, 
he had the opportunity to visit several underground churches. In one of these, with a congregation of nearly 100 people, Don realized that only two people had Bibles, the pastor and one older woman, who sat near the center of the congregation. As the pastor preached, every time he would read a scripture passage, that woman would hold her open Bible high above her head. Don watched as all those around her gazed longingly upon the written word of God. Many had tears in their eyes, praying that they too someday could hold in their hands their own copy of God's word. In this moment, the Lord called Donald Sturtz to spend the rest of his natural life getting the word of God into the hands of people who don't have it. Romans 10:17 says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Ken and Tricia Sturtz joined the Baptist Couriers for Christ ministry in 1984. It was on a trip to Poland earlier that year that the Holy Spirit touched Ken's heart with this question, can you forget what you've seen here? Ken left his job as a metal fabricator and Tricia stepped back from her nursing career as they took their young family on the road in obedience of God's call. It was their earnest desire by partnering with Donna and Laura to see the ministry of Couriers for Christ grow for the purpose of reaching more souls in Eastern Europe. The core focus of the ministry is assisting church planning through scripture distribution. We earnestly believe that the word of God changes lives. So we have done and continue to do all that we can to get scriptures into the hands of people throughout Europe and beyond. The ministry began during communism. In that time period, it was much harder to move scriptures behind the iron curtain, literally made of steel, barbed wire, and concrete. There were armed guards and very controlled border crossings. The only option for couriers to move Bibles into these countries was to use vehicles with secret compartments and a network of Bible smugglers. Every attempt to smuggle in scriptures was like a covert spy operation with the highest stakes. The runners risked imprisonment or possibly death if discovered. The Eastern European Christians in this time period were often persecuted for their faith in Christ, as was the case with this dear pastor who was permanently crippled as a result of the beatings that he received while imprisoned. His crime? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. In 1990, the wall came down, which opened Eastern Europe to receive the gospel freely. This photo, taken in the spring of 1990, is Ken Sturtz street preaching to a large crowd in Ukraine. Just a few months earlier, he could have been jailed or even deported for this activity. Many container loads of scripture were shipped to these former communist nations in the upcoming years. God has blessed through the sacrificial giving of many churches across the United States, which have enabled us to send over 115 20-foot containers into Europe. Each one of these containers is filled with tens of thousands of copies of scriptures. Please pray that these continue to reach those precious souls on the other side of the world. By the early 2000s, couriers began to get requests for help in ministering physically in Europe. Many American missionaries had found Europe to be a difficult field. Most European citizens have been ignorant to the gospel because of the years of atheistic communist control and also the influence of organized religion, such as Russian Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. Even though the missionaries now had literature to distribute, they still had one plea, we need help. In answer to this challenge, God gave couriers the vision of assisting these missionaries by means of scripture distribution campaigns. The goal was to help their church plant or young struggling church by bringing a team of Americans of like faith and practice to their city. That group of about 30 Americans would be divided into smaller teams and given the responsibility to hand out as many copies of John and Romans as possible during a 10-day period. This is done by face-to-face -face distribution on the streets and also going door-to-door. By God's grace, American teams over the last 22 years have physically handed out nearly 2.6 million copies of John and Romans. These are marked editions with the plan of salvation clearly presented in a gospel tract form on pages in the front or back of the booklet. 
The teams would also pass out flyers that contained an invitation to an evangelistic service held at the end of the trip, hosted by the missionary at a neutral location. Anyone attending this service would receive a free Bible provided by Couriers for Christ and be given an invitation to a follow-up Bible study beginning the next week, hosted by the missionary. God has given Couriers for Christ the privilege of carrying out more than 28 of these campaigns in 45 cities across Europe. We have seen over 2,000 people receive Christ as Savior at the meetings, including Nadia, a young school teacher from Kiev, who declared that she couldn't wait to tell her students what Jesus did for her. David was an atheist college student who is now saved, married to a Christian woman, a father and training for full-time ministry. Over the years, more than 25 churches across Europe have been strengthened to keep fighting the good fight, and more than 10 churches have been planted to the glory of God. It is our earnest desire to continue these scripture campaigns across Europe and beyond as the Lord leads. Campaigns are only one avenue we use to get the word of God into the hands of those who don't have it. Couriers for Christ continues to send an average of five container loads of scripture per year across Europe and beyond. As missionaries reach out to us with specific needs for their field, Couriers has been able to provide Bibles, New Testaments, hymnals, tracts, or discipleship materials that they have requested. We always have a Bible project in progress. In the last few years, we have been actively fundraising to print and transport pocket-sized whole Bibles for the Polish military, police, and first responders. Multiple containers of scripture have gone directly into Ukraine since the war began in February of 2022. Our ministry has also been involved in financing Bible translation projects for countries that do not have an accurate version of the Bible in their dialect, most recently in a closed Southeast Asian country. All of these are provided due to the faithful support and gifts from our partner churches at no cost to the missionary. We need your help. We earnestly desire your prayers on our behalf for safety, for God's leading, and for his power to accomplish this great task before us. You can give. We are seeking monthly financial supporters for the ministry, but you can also give towards one of our Bible project as God directs. Or you can join us. Take two weeks and come with the couriers on a scripture distribution campaign. There are upcoming trips that need laborers in order to reach as much of those cities as is possible. All you need is a passport, the finances to go, and the strength to be on your feet for about seven hours a day. Or if you don't have the health to join us, maybe you would like to sponsor someone else to take the gospel on your behalf. There are so many lost souls to be reached throughout Europe and beyond. We earnestly desire your partnership to reach those lost and dying souls with the life-giving message of the gospel found only in God's holy word. Uh, accept that challenge, amen, to uh, be in prayer uh, for the ministry and uh, pray that God will continue to use them in a great and mighty way. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Sturts to come, preach God's word, and uh, you give him your undivided attention here this evening. All right. well, thank you. Yep, I turned it. All right. Well, I hope you uh, understand kind of now what it's all about. It's not a, uh, a mission mission work like uh, traditionally where you're, you're supporting a family on the field, but we have been able to take many people from many families and uh, spend time with them on the field. And it's not just a help to the missionaries, it's a help to the people who go on the trips. Because many of them, after the trip is over, they say, now I understand what a mission missionary goes through, what his life is like on the field. Both the positive part of it and the negative part of it. Uh, for instance, we had uh, in uh, Ukraine, we had uh, a missionary mother who, <laughs> when we were there, she, she was looking for her eight-year-old son, and she was going to go to the grocery store. And we said, well, why do you need him along? And she said, well, he knows the language. I don't. And we said, she said, I'm going to school to learn language, and he's not. He's out there with the kids on the street playing with them, 
And she said, he, he knows more of the language than I do. Well, you know, those are things you never think about because kids are able to, you know, they pick it up quick because they, their, their, their minds, their, their bodies, their ability to make the sounds and everything are, are better sometimes than, our, than older people are. So there's all kinds of things that you, you learn. And we've had people surrender for missions that are in the mission, on the mission field now that came on one of our trips. And we've had a lot of people that have come back. We had a man on the split campaign uh, trip who's been on a dozen, on 12 of our trips now into Europe. We had Dave Darling, who's from Minnesota, who's doing now his own campaigns in Africa. And he's done some in Brazil. And uh, he, he got his start coming. He had 15 times he was with us in various campaigns over the years. So it's been an ongoing thing. And you, as supporters, what you saw there is a part of your ministry. The Apostle Paul said, I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Amen. If you supported that, you prayed for us, you're a part of that ministry as much as we are. So I thank you and I, and I praise you for your dedication and for supporting us all these years. It's been a real, real blessing to us. Tonight, I'd, I'd like to uh, consider the, the uh, question, what, what is the overarching theme of the Bible? What is the principle that the Bible portrays to us that we must, as people, as human beings, follow? Well, I submit to you, I, I've entitled this mes message, uh, Choice. The, the overarching thing that the Bible presents is that life itself is made up of choices. Right. When you got up this morning, you made choices. You decided uh, you were going to get out of bed. You decided what clothes you're going to put on. You decided whether or not you're going to drink coffee. You decided whether or not you're going to eat breakfast. Yeah. You decided whether or not you're going to read your Bible. Yeah. Uh, all those things, some of those things, we don't sit there and go, well, should I or shouldn't I? You just automatically do it, but it is a choice. And you've chosen to do what you do. And in all of our lives, you make choices or you refuse or you don't make a choice. And that is a choice. Right. Sad to say many times that is a choice. Uh, right. This last year, they tell us that 80,000 young people died from drugs. And you say, well, did they get up in the morning one day and say, you know what? I think I'm going to. Okay, I, I, I can refuse to take drugs or I can take drugs. I think I'll take drugs. No, I don't think hardly any of them said that. But they didn't make a choice, but they fell into a situation where a choice was made for them. And they fell into it, and all of a sudden they were in way beyond that what they could, could handle, and it ended up killing them. Yeah. Fentanyl, the drugs that are out there, the things that are going on. And sad to say, there's an awful lot of people in this world today that are not making a choice for Christ because they refuse to look into it or they're into sin or there's a reason why they're, they're rejecting it, sometimes consciously, but most of the time not even consciously. They just don't want anything to do it. And they give all kinds of excuses. Well, he, Jesus was just another teacher. He's just another religion. He's just this or he's just that. Well, really? Do you really know that? No, they, they're just... The spirit that's in them, the Bible tells us, which is the spirit of Satan that works with lost people, keeps them away. The, the, the Bible says the devil has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Yeah, right. And it's sad. And when you pray for lost people, what you're saying is, God, please take the blinders off of them and let them see what they need to see, which is Christ, the Redeemer, the Savior of the world. And that's what it's all about. So the first thing that involves your choices is your heart. The heart is the real you deep down inside. We got a screen up here that was, you know, showed the, 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 the little DVD there and that. Not a single one of us would want what was in our heart, even today, to be shown on that screen. Why? Because there are thoughts that come into your mind, there are thoughts that, that cross your mind, yet you say, I don't want anybody to know this. Yeah. Well, where those thoughts are, that is your heart. That's what's deep down inside of you, in your soul, in your heart. And you don't want everybody to see that. Well, what does the Bible say about the heart? Uh, 
think about it. There, there's a lot being said in our culture today about the heart. Um, the other day we were in a, we were in a, uh, a car dealership and uh, I was sitting there, we were waiting, and there was a magazine laying there and it had Arnold Schwarzenegger's picture on the front of it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And underneath of his picture it said, Arnold says, just follow your heart. And I thought, well, what does the Bible say about that? The Bible says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Yeah. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Wow, that's a whole lot different. Uh, some of you ladies, you might watch Hallmark movies. Now, Hallmark movies are basically clean, a lot of them. They're not, you know, there's nothing bad about them. They all got the same plot, you know, the, the lady goes somewhere, meets the guy, the guy, you know, they get in a little tiff, and, and, and then they settle that, later on they, they come together, and it all ends happily ever after, right? That's the way it is. Well, the kind of the theme of those, is, if you listen to it, what they're saying is, just follow your heart. And you go, now wait a minute, is, is that the right thing to do? Um, there's a lot of romances that start with the giggles and fun and silliness and all that, and it all looks so great, and you got a handsome guy and a pretty girl, but it won't, it won't end up so good down the road yeah. because the character isn't there to sustain a loving, caring relationship. Something's yeah. wrong with the heart, that's right. and that's the problem. The heart is deceitful above all things. What did Jesus say about the human heart uh, in, in Mark? Chapter 7, Mark chapter 7, um, Jesus would never win any awards at a college or any institution of learning if he came and said what he said right here in Mark chapter 7 in verse 20. He said, and he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. That's right. Wow, that's sure different than Arnold's statement of saying, just follow your heart. Well, the Bible says your heart's deceitful. Yeah. Above all, it can lead you in the wrong direction, big time. That's right. And all these sins, and that's why I said, Jesus Christ is the only one who ever said anything like this. Nobody, you know what the college professors say? You know what humanity says in general? There's a spark of divinity in all of us. Yeah. Oh, really? That's the biggest deception of all. Yeah. The Bible says... You've got the spirit of Satan working in you when you're lost. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, at the spirit, it says that now works in the children of disobedience. That's right. When you're disobedient to the word of God, Satan has free reign to come through your, 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 your heart and mind and deceive you into the wrong directions. Right. Wow. It's something to think about. So, the heart is the central problem. When you're born, you're born in sin. You're born in iniquity, the Bible says. You're born with evil within you that you can't help. It's just there. Now, any lady, any ladies, you don't, you don't believe, uh, if, if you say, well, I don't believe that that's true. I think kids, you know, they learn evil as they get older. Just ask the ladies who work in the nursery. <laughs> just ask them. You see two little cuds tugging away at a toy. That's mine, that's mine. All of a sudden, they're banging each other over the head and and they're, they're fighting, and they're scratching, and they're scrapping. And you go, where did that come from? Did they learn that? Did somebody teach them? No, it's right in them. It's just there. And it can cause serious trouble later on. If they're not, this pride is not knocked down in their learned obedience. You've got to learn obedience. It's not put into you naturally. And sad to say right now, this generation that's rising up, that's rebelling in all the colleges, that's rebelling all over, the, all over the United States now, a lot of it's coming from the fact that these children that are growing up now were never learned the word no. 
Nobody ever put them down. Nobody ever spanked them. Remember years ago, can't spank children. Bible says, you spare the rod, you're going to spoil the child. And the Bible says, if you beat him with the rod, he's not going to die. You'll deliver his soul from hell. Wow, that's serious. And that's the truth. And so life's choices are made by learning, by experiencing uh, the word, first of all, the word no. You, there's some things you just, uh, you just can't do because they're wrong. They're going to hurt you. They're evil. That's right. And when a mother guides her children, uh, you know, the, recently, I don't know if you saw that, there was a football player on the news. And he just made this simple statement. He said, I think some of you women, the college women, he said, I think that you really would like to get married and raise some children and have a family. And, you know, you and I would say, well, that's, that's great. That's perfectly normal. He got blasted for that. They practically were ready to throw him out of the country for that. Whoa, we, we don't want to be known as a housewife. Wow, we want a career. We want money. We want prestige. And so they rebelled against the very thought of him saying, you college women, some of you, some of you should desire to get married and raise a family. Yeah. Well, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And that's true. It really is. You realize that Alexander the Great, uh, 300 and some B.C., he conquered the entire world. When he was 20, around 20 years old, he had already, by the time he was uh, around 30, in less than 10 years, with his army, he had conquered the entire known world. And when he got done with that, they said he wept because there was no more places to conquer. He was in 55 major battles without ever getting seriously wounded. You know why all that happened? Because his mother taught him that he was descended from the gods and that he was not a man, he was a god, and nothing could harm him. And the devil saw to it that he wasn't harmed for all that time. The hand that rocked his cradle said, Alexander, you're not a man. You're a god. And that changed the whole known world at that time. Uh, listen, there's an awful lot of power in a mother and the direction she gives and the guidance that she gives. But life says choices. And those choices are augmented. They're fed by the things around you that you hear and that you see. And, of course, the main one. It's the parents, the mother and the father. And then, of course, it ought to be your church. It ought to be the Bible. It ought to be the wisdom from the Word of God. And the Bible says, if there's no Word of God in them, what wisdom is in them? Yeah. You look right now at our government in, in Washington, D.C., and you say, wow, it just seems like a bunch of chaos. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to solve the problems. They don't even know what a man and a woman is. They can't figure it out. And you say, why is it that way? Because there's no wisdom in them from the Word of God. That's right. They threw the Bible out of the schools. They threw the Bible, uh, taking the Scripture off the walls wherever they could. They said, we don't want religion. We don't want this anymore. We're going to run the show. Man, us. And their deceived, wicked hearts are getting the whole world into a lot of trouble. Yeah. And they seems to be, Jesus said in the last days there would be perplexity. Perplexity means a situation in which there's nowhere to turn. Yeah. It's like, there's not, what can we do? It's hopeless. Well, the Bible says in, that the children of Israel, God drove them into corners. Yeah. A corner is a place where you've got nowhere to turn. The only thing you can do is look up. Maybe I can get out by looking up. Well, you can. You can turn to God and look up. Amen. But life is choices. Joshua uh, uh, chapter 1 God spoke to Joshua, and he said, Be strong and of a good courage. And then in verse 7, he said, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Uh, he says, Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You want a successful marriage? You want a successful career? You want a successful family? Do you want the gifts of God, the blessings of God, the things that are going to make you happy and bring you joy when you get older? 
Well, then you're going to have to wisdom, have the wisdom that comes from the Word of God. Yeah, that's right. Read it every day. Take it in. Learn it. Memorize it. Because it is the way of life, the Bible says. In Joshua chapter 24, when the book is closing, Joshua then, who's lived his life according to the Word of God, did he make mistakes? Yeah, we all make mistakes. But he repented of those mistakes and went on. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. But it says... In uh, Joshua 24, in, in, uh, in, in, in the first uh, verse, or, or verse uh, uh, 15, I should say, and, it came, and if it seem evil unto you, Joshua speaking, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Do you remember what the apostle Peter said? Jesus said, are you going to go away? He's talking to some of his disciples. Yeah. And Peter said this, he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah. Whoa, that's, where else are you going to go? What can Buddha offer you? What can, what can Muhammad offer you? Ask a, a, any Muslim, sometimes say, how can I get to heaven? Show me how I can definitely know that I'm going to heaven. And they'll be stumped. They'll say, well, we, 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 we hope so. We're, we're, and they're scared to death of the future. Because Allah, their Allah, is capricious. He can change his mind. He can do it. You know, the Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. Amen. Well, Allah changes his mind. And they're scared of that. They don't know what's going to happen to them in eternity. So, if you kill yourself as a martyr, that's probably the best chance you've got to get to heaven. But that's scary to them, too. So, can you imagine that, having a religion that says, all right, your pastor says to you, if you go out and kill yourself for the cause of Christ, then you'll get to heaven. But without that, no, no, you're probably not going to make it. Well, you'd say, boy, that, you wouldn't sleep at night. You'd say, that, that's horrible. That's awful. Well, you don't have to do that. Jesus died in your place. He paid the price for, for your sin. And Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. He says, your fathers that served Idols, he said, on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. A lot of homes I've been in, a lot of churches, they have that, that verse written on a wall. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I hope that's on your wall, especially the wall of your heart. Right. You say, yes, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to put down sin. I'm going to do the best I can to repent of sin and give God, God the glory and the power over my life to make my life what it ought to be as a Christian. I'm going to serve the Lord. And every one of us has varying talents, some more than others, but you can do something. You can pray, you can give, you can just come and say amen in the pew, you know, and that's a good start. Just be here and serve God. Like Joshua said, I'm going to choose to serve the Lord. So life is choices. And then choose the commandments of God. There's a, there's a wave of thinking that's going out there, even in the Christian world right now, that says you don't have to do the commandments. You, you, don't, you, know, you can just kind of do what you want. And uh, God understands, and there's a lot of grace out there. You just live kind of the way you want, and he forgives everything anyway. It doesn't really matter. Well, wait a minute. What the Bible says we ought to take heed to. And we ought to do the commandments that God has, has given us. And in chapter uh, 4, verse 21, uh, the Apostle John in 1 John says this, And this commandment have we from him, this commandment, that he who loveth God love his brother also. That, that is a tremendously important thing. Um, what, what does the world need right now more than anything else? Putin right now has got a big war going on in Ukraine, and he's trying to force those people into his kingdom. Well, would you, would you serve somebody who's blowing up your homes, destroying your economy, killing your relatives, killing your very family, ruining the lives of tens of thousands of people? Fifteen million people have left the Ukraine. And Putin is saying, no, no, all of you are going to belong to me. I'm going to force you into my kingdom. Well, what kind of a situation is that? I mean, 
No one wants that kind of a thing. God says the opposite. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. What's good for you, you ought to see as good for someone else. What I want for me, I want for them. I want them to prosper like I prosper. You know, I, I grew up on a farm, and, and we go to farm auctions sometimes, where there's an auction where a husband dies or something like that, and maybe his wife is selling the farm, selling the machinery, whatever, and she has to get rid of it. She has to let it go. And I listen to farmers talk sometimes, and, and not, not all of them are like this, but many times you'll find somebody that comes to an auction, and they'll say, well, I think... I think the old lady really doesn't know what this is worth. I think I could get it a pennies on the dollar. And I'm standing there and I'm going, wait a minute. Is that the kind of love you ought to show to this person? I mean, you ought to, listen, if you love her and you care for her, a good deal for you is a good deal for her as well. You want it to be fair for the both of you. If you're out there to constantly trying to get whatever you can get away from somebody else, you don't love them. Uh, it's just a huge flaw in your Christian thinking. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then in verse 2 and 3, it says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Amen. Uh, think about the Ten Commandments. Just, just think about a few of those commandments. What if nobody ever told a lie? Thou shalt not bear false witness. All the court cases in Washington, D.C., everything that's going on right now, all the lawyers and all of it, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get to the truth. And then a lot of them don't want the truth. They want to bring up things and lie about something to further their cause. And you go, it's hopeless. It's like there's nothing but all this bickering and lying and cheating and deceiving that's going on. Well, what if they obeyed what the Bible said and only sought and did the truth? What if the commandment, thou shalt not steal, was obeyed by everybody? Yeah. Think about that. No locks on the doors. No bank vaults. No lock on your doors. But you'd go into the bank and all the money would be sitting on a shelf. Yeah. And you say, well, I can't imagine that. Why? Because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And all you can imagine is people stealing money that's just laying around. But if nobody stole anything, you could leave whatever you have in the open. You, you could leave your doors open. Nobody's going to bother you. Why? Because they love you like they love themselves. And they don't want to see you hurt by stealing something from you. And thou shalt not commit adultery. What if every husband was faithful to his wife and every wife was faithful to her husband? And they loved their children. And they said, for heaven's sake and for our children's sake and for the people around us, for God's sake, we are going to live together and love each other the way we ought to. Amen. And they say, this is what's right. This is what's good. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's right. Wow. And fornication. Don't commit a fornication. You know something? There's a lot of talk nowadays about, about abortion and stopping abortion. You know, millions of babies killed. You know what causes abortion? It's sexual intercourse without love. That's what causes it. It's called in the Bible fornication. And it's so randomly practiced today in our country and around the world, really, that I, preachers no longer even preach against it. Because you know what they'll hear if they preach against it? They'll say, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. So what are you going to do? Well, yeah, what you're going to have is abortion. And if young people obeyed that command and said, we're going to wait till marriage. We're going to do this right. And I'm only going to have sex with somebody I love and that I want to have children with. It would change everything. But that's not the way people think. I'm going to do it my way. Well, I can't control myself. The Bible says that one of the fruits of the Spirit is temperance and, and uh, having the ability to control. And Paul talks about controlling your vessel. This body is my vessel. You have a vessel. God says, control yourself. Control yourself. And that's what we need to do as believers if we're going to serve God. And then 
Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 13, uh, Romans chapter 13 has a, uh, a wonderful uh, a kind of, it kind of explains what the commandments are, what end they lead to. In verse 8, Romans chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Oh, no man anything. Don't take something from somebody else and, and be a debtor to them and, you know, cause trouble in your relationship. Oh, no man anything, but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You say, what is, what is love in its basic tenant, in its, its basic platform? What is love? It's working no ill to your neighbor. You don't want to hurt anybody. You want to see them have prosperity like you do. You want to see them have the kind of a life that's happy and joyful. And uh, talks here about coveting. There's so much coveting going on now. Well, hey, you people that have money, you have good jobs and everything. You don't deserve that. We people who are out on the street, yeah, we don't want to work. We don't want to do any of that stuff. But we want the same money that you got. We want to live, we want to have a place to live with a roof over our heads. You ought to give us food and everything else. The Bible says if not any would not work, neither should he eat. That's right. Whoa, that's a pretty serious commandment. The Apostle Paul said, if you don't want to work, you don't want a job. It's one thing in Russia. You know what they did? They gave everybody a job. Everybody worked. You had to work. And even if you were a street sweeper, okay, can't do anything else, they give you a broom. And they say, get out in the street. You're going to be out there all day and sweep the streets. You say, well, that's pretty harsh. Well, listen, you, then you got a better job. He said, I'll, I'll do something better than sweeping the streets. Yeah. Today, we're letting people get by with murder. We're letting them get by with not working, no responsibility, not willing to do anything that the Bible says that makes for the character that makes life sweet. And then we wonder, why do we have all these troubles? And then... We have to live with repentance and faith. Um, David Gibbs one time preached the message, uh, Christian Law Association, I never forgot. He said he was preaching on, on King David. And David made some horrible mistakes. He killed Uriah the Hittite in the army, sent him up to the front so he'd been murdered because he wanted Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. And so he committed adultery, and then he killed the husband of this woman Bathsheba and took her for his own wife. And Nathan the prophet came to him and said, listen, David, you're the man. You're in trouble with God. I mean, you've killed a man and now you've taken his wife. And the Bible says, and, and uh, David Gibbs said this, he said, David, one of the chief characteristics he had is he was a good repenter. He saw his sin when it was brought to his attention and immediately said, you're right. I, I really messed up. I'm, I'm really smitten with this. I'm sorry I did it, and I, 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 I deserve God's wrath, but I'm glad for his mercy. You look up the word mercy. Mercy is the ability to show a, a compassion when, like God to him, could show his entire wrath against David, even kill him. But God showed mercy and let him live. And he was forgiven this awful sin that he committed. And if you read Psalm 136, I think there's 22 verses in that psalm. And every verse ends with the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. Yeah. 22 times in that one chapter. Why did David say that? Because he was so enraptured with the idea that God had mercy on him when he could have poured out his wrath in justice on King David. Right. So... Are you a good repenter? Do you repent of sin? Do you ask the Holy Spirit, say, Lord, where am I failing? What's my sins that I need to repent of? Uh, sometimes there's things in our lives that we don't even recognize. Like David didn't recognize even his adultery and his murder 
I'm the king. I can do what I want. I got power. Oh, really? Really? Uh, listen, you're subject to the law of God as well as anybody else. But repentance and then faith. Are you trusting the Lord? Um, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ in, in first, first John, in first John, and in chapter two, and verse two, it says this, and he, that's Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He died for every sin. Every sin is covered by his blood. And then up above that, it says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. When you come to, Jesus is a lawyer. When you get in big trouble, you want a lawyer. You want somebody that's really smart that can help you through the situation that you're in. But Jesus is the lawyer that advocates between us and God the Father. The devil is the accuser. He says, hey, look at what so-and-so did. Look at what these people are doing. Look at, and, and, and God says, yeah, but Jesus, my son, came and said, I paid for all those sins. They're paid for. And if you repent and you say, Lord, I want your mercy. And, and say, I, I won't do that anymore. I want your help to be a better Christian, a better believer. And the Bible says he will advocate for you, and he's a propitiation, a covering for all of your sin. It's a wonderful thing. But you need to, uh, to bring it to him in prayer. And then the Bible says in Hebrews uh, chapter 7, 24 and 25, it says, the priesthood of Christ, it says, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Jesus is interceding for you and for me on the right hand of God the Father. Um, he's the one who's, who's there every time you pray and you say, I messed up, I sinned, and I want your forgiveness, I want to do better. And the Bible says we'll cleanse ourselves little by little. How do you become a better Christian? Well, not by pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps. You can't do that. But you have to submit to the Lord and say, yeah, I've sinned, and I love your mercy. I love your kindness, your grace toward me. And as you grasp that like David did, if you read the Psalms, it's full of David over and over again mentioning the mercy and the love of God that was shed for him. Psalm 51, read that. That was David's repentance, the chapter in the Bible that tells of his repentance toward the Lord when he uh, was uh, in, in so much uh, trouble with the Lord. And then Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, it says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence. It says, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. Where did we start? Well, the heart's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, the heart has got wickedness in it. And so God says, okay, you got to get the wickedness out. Repent of your sin and let the love of God come in. And it's a continual process. We're never going to arrive perfectly in this life. But listen, you can become through the power of God, with the Spirit of God in your life, you can become a Christian who can be a witness and a testimony to somebody else that can change their life forever. Right. About, what, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, I was able to lead Trisha's mother to the Lord. Amen. I've known her for 52 years. She's 92 years old. When I first met her, she said this to me. She said, you're not one of these Apostle Paul people, are you? And I said, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, in other words, Apostle Paul said the woman ought to be in subjection to the man. And she was kind of like a feminazi, one of these uh, you know, women who said, look, women are equal with men. Uh, I'm not taking anything from any man. And uh, so I was suspect for years. It was like, yeah, you're that religious guy who took my daughter and you're, you know, and I said, no, I didn't take your daughter. She volunteered, you know. I asked her to marry me, and she, and it's like she didn't want to believe that. It's like somehow, uh, you're twisting her arm or something. There's something not. Well, life went on over years and years and years, and, and her watching our lives together, 
and there's some amazing things that have happened. One time we had our daughter, our daughter Jennifer was in, uh, in uh, Lithuania and she had some health problems. She was on a mission trip and she ended up in a hospital. And uh, Trisha called the airlines and said, I need to, I need to get to, to uh, uh, Lithuania, to Vilnius. And there was an American clinic there. And how are you gonna get there fast? Well, the airlines could take her as far as Warsaw, Poland, but 200 more miles to the north is Lithuania. They didn't fly into there. So Trisha made a phone call to missionaries that we know, and the missionaries said, just get to Warsaw. We'll take you immediately right up to, to uh, Vilnius when you get here. And her mother was just astonished. She said, how do you know all these people? Why are they willing to help you like this? And we said, because God's family is a wonderful family. We love them. They love us. And, and this works. We can go anywhere in the world and we have friends because we know the Lord and the Lord has changed them and us and we have this marvelous family in Christ. She was just stunned. It's like, I can't believe this, you know? And things like that happen. Well, she ended up a few weeks back in the hospital, nearly died. Her heartbeat went down to 19 a minute. And you know that you can't sustain life that way. Well, anyway, they got to the hospital, they revived her, and on a Sunday morning, I woke up and I was so burdened for her, I told Trish, I gotta see your mother. And so I went down to the hospital, and uh, fortunately, there weren't any nurses in there, it was not breakfast time yet, it was early, it was 7.30, and uh, I told her, I said, Mom Schultz, I said, you know we prayed for you all these years. And she said, I know you have. And I said, you know you need to be saved. You need to trust the Lord. And she said, well, she was, she was very humble about it. And then I said, you know that Jesus died and paid for your sins. I said, it's all paid for. All you need to do is just call on him and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I want you to save me. Take me to heaven when I die. And she stopped a moment, and she said, and, and I, I know she was trying to figure out, well, how am I going to say this? I said, you can pray after me if you mean it. And she sweetly prayed and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. And she said, I want you to save me. Take me to heaven when I die. Amen. And I said, if you meant that, I said, it's all paid for. I said, if I handed you $1,000, if I handed you a $1 million, I said, would you have to pay for it? And she said, well, no, if you gave it to me. I said, Jesus just gave you eternal life. Yeah, he true. died on the cross and he paid the price. And all you need to do is say yes to him. He's already yeah. said yes for you. And I said, our pastor uh, Nelson, our pastor Nelson, he used to say, you know, there's three votes. The devil says, no, you're going to hell. God says, yes, I want you in heaven. You make the deciding vote. That's right. You know, you can say no to God and you can agree with the devil or you can say yes to the Lord and go to heaven eternally. And she got saved. Hey. And it was one of the biggest triumphs in my life because praying for her for a long, long time, she's a smart woman. She's very intelligent. She's not somebody that likes to be pulled one over on her. And uh, for her to get saved was just really a big triumph. Uh, before that, like uh, not even a year ago, I have a, a, a neighbor, Bud Carpenter. He's 102 years old. He was in the Tinian Islands in the World War II and got shot, got badly wounded. He was six months in the hospital. And he, all of his life, never went to church. I went to witness to him, and he said, I just want to die like a dog and be dead. I've seen everything I want to see. I've done everything I want to do. I don't want anything else. And I said, Bud, that's not the way it is. The Bible tells us you are a soul before God made in his image that lives forever. Yeah. And I said, you, you can make it up the way you want, but you'll be wrong. I said, if you read what God said, that's what's right. And I didn't get far that day, but I went back about two weeks later, the same thing, I got up in the morning, I said, I got to go see Bud. And I went to see him, and I talked to him, I witnessed to him again, and finally, uh, after a long time, and, and, and I said, look, I, I'm not going to twist your arm, I, I, you've got to decide yourself. And finally, he was looking at the floor, and he was sitting in his chair, and he said, I'll pray. And he prayed a short prayer, it's Tim Carpenter's dad, and uh, he prayed a short prayer and just said, Lord, I, I'm a sinner, Save me, take me to heaven. And I said, that seems simple to you. But I said, that is very, very profound. And Tim, or Tim Carpenter said, 
That next week, he said, my dad said, I want to go to church. And he said he never would have said that had he not gotten saved. 102 years old. And a few weeks beyond that, he died and went to heaven. And so, is it worth it? Yeah, it's worth it. What else is there that's worth it? You know, money, you say, people want to make money. There's channels on television where they show you how to make a lot of money and invest in the stock market. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But there's only so much that money can buy. Can't buy you heaven, can't buy you health. It can't buy you uh, the, the kind of friendships that you can have in Christ. It can't buy a lot of things. And so choose this day who you will serve, like the Bible said, like Joshua said. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Let's, uh, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings to us. Thank you for this word of God that's so plain that we can choose, we can make a choice, and we can decide whether we're small or great, whether we're simple or smart, or, or whether whoever we are, we can say, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. And I just pray that tonight every one of us would choose and say, like Joshua, yes, I want to choose to serve the Lord. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this church, for these dear people. Bless them, use them, help them all to see people saved. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. With every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here today, you'd say, Pastor Hallett, I want to choose the Lord. I, I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I'm going to choose him today. Pastor, in this brief prayer, would you pray for me? I don't know if I'm saved, but would you pray for me? My prayer for you will not save you, but if you'd give me the privilege and opportunity to pray for you, I'd appreciate that. Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't know if I'm saved. Would you pray for me? Would you indicate that need just by slipping your hand up real quick like and slip it back down? And I'll see your hand. God knows your heart's need. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? The other question then is this. You say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I'm on, I'm on my way to heaven. But I've made some wrong choices in life. And I want to start making some right choices. I want to start making some right choices that I can get to the end of life and say, boy, I'm glad I made the right choices in life. I know we're, we're not, we know we're not going to be perfect. But you'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I'd make some right choices from this day forward? Would you pray for me? Would you hit that knee just by slipping your hand up and slip it back down? I'll see your hand. God knows your heart's need. Yes, thank you and thank you. Put their hands all over this auditorium here tonight. Thank you if you slip them down. Anybody else? Pastor, would you pray for me? I didn't raise my hand a moment ago, but God spoke in my heart. Would you pray for me? Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? Yes, I see that one as well, and that one, and this one over here. Anybody else, Pastor? Pray for me. God spoke to my heart. I didn't raise my hand a moment ago, but God spoke to my heart. Yes, I see that hand. Thank you. We slip them down. Thank you. I see that one as well. In just a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I want to invite you to, you can come up to these steps here as an, and use it as an old-fashioned altar and come before the Lord and say, Lord, would you help me to make some right choices? Maybe perhaps you could just come and say, Lord, I've been making some right choices. Would you help me to continue? I, I don't want to stop making right choices. Lord, would you help me to continue to make some right choices? Won't you come during the invitation time? Won't you come? Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts. Bless now this invitation time, Lord. I pray you be glorified through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone stand to their feet.